So this summer, two new research papers were released on how supermassive black holes grow and how fast they spin. And it just so happens that I wrote them alongside my collaborators, but especially Ricarda Beckman from Cambridge. Now, Ricarda is a theorist who runs simulations of the universe on a computer, whereas I am an observer. I go to telescopes and I take data and that's how I do my research. But here we teamed up to analyze some simulations like they were observations. Now, some of you might remember Ricarda from my video on how astrophysicists use code when I interviewed her for the simulations section. Now, of the two papers that came out, I'm going to focus on this one about supermassive black hole spins and how that's tied to how they grow. And that's because every time I tell people I'm working on this, you guys seem to be so intrigued by this idea of black hole spin. So in this video, we're gonna chat first about what do we actually mean by spin and then how fast black holes can spin. Second, why the spin of a supermassive black hole matters for the galaxy that they're in the center of. Three, what were the results that Ricardo and I found for how the different ways of growing a supermassive black hole affect spin. And then four, how we then test these results from simulations with actual observations of the universe. So let's start with what do we actually mean by spin for a black hole? Well, it's the same concept as for any other object. The Earth, for example, spins on its axis and that's what gives us the length of the day. All the other planets spin on their axis as well with different day lengths and of course the Sun spins on its axis like all other stars do. Now when physicists say spin, what they really mean is angular momentum. Angular meaning moving through angles, so moving in a circle around an axis. And then momentum, I like to think of as a measure of how hard it is to stop something that's already moving. And momentum depends on mass, so how heavy you are, and velocity, i.e. the speed of an object. So something that's incredibly heavy is very hard to stop when it's already moving. And something that's moving with, you know, very fast is also hard to stop once it's already moving. And the key thing about angular momentum is that it has to be conserved. So if anything about a system changes, the angular momentum before has to equal the angular momentum afterwards. So if you have a very massive star that during its normal life, happily rotating around an axis with some spin or angular momentum, when that star then runs out of fuel and goes supernova, the core of that star will then collapse under gravity into a black hole, a region of space so dense that not even light can escape. But remember, we have to conserve angular momentum. So the angular momentum of the star before it went supernova has to be the same for the black hole that was formed afterwards. So just like the star was before it went supernova, the black hole will now still be spinning. It will have some angular momentum. The key thing is though, even though the angular momentum is the same, the speed at which the black hole is actually spinning at will increase. And to understand that, if we just look at the equations here for how you'd work out, you know, the angular momentum before and after. If you think about it in the simplest case where you've just got something that's spherical, then angular momentum is two fifths times the mass of the object times by the radius squared times by the angular velocity. So instead of a normal velocity being measured as, you know, like kilometers a second or miles an hour, an angular velocity would be measured as like, you know, how many times a second does this object rotate on its axis? So if you think about before and after, here. The mass of the core of the star has stayed the same as the mass that's in the black hole, but the radius is decreased because the black hole has got much denser. And so the angular velocity goes up. So the black hole is spinning a lot faster than the star was originally before it went supernova. This is a concept that everybody is familiar with. Think of an ice skater drawing their arms in to spin much faster in the same way. The mass of the ice skater before and after is the same, but the radius has decreased. So the angular velocity has gone up and they spin that much faster. So black holes spin just like anything else, but there is also a limit to how fast black holes can spin. And that's when the event horizon itself around the black hole would be traveling at the speed of light. Now the event horizon is that point of no return where anything approaching the black hole would have to be traveling faster than the speed of light to escape. It's this sphere within which we don't receive any light. And so that's really what we define as the black hole hole in terms of its radius and whatever's contained in that sphere, its mass. Now this is also known for a non-spinning black hole as the Schwarzschild radius. And you can calculate that as two times G, which is the gravitational constant, 
times by the mass of the black hole divided by c squared, the speed of light squared. But when the black hole is spinning, a black hole has extra energy in the form of rotational energy. And as Einstein tells us, E equals mc squared. Energy and mass are equivalent. So that extra energy means the black hole is heavier, it has more mass. But if a black hole has more mass, then the event horizon shrinks. So if you want to know the radius of a black hole, the size of an event horizon for a spinning black hole, you don't use Schwarzschild solutions, you use Roy Kerr's solution, which tells you that the radius of the event horizon is then g, the gravitational constant, times by the mass of the black hole, divided by c squared, but this time times by 1 plus the square root of 1 minus a squared. Now, A is a proxy for the spin here, which is just angular momentum divided by mass. So A equals J over M. So when A equals zero, the black hole isn't spinning, and that whole equation just reduces back to Schwarzschild's radius for the event horizon of a black hole. But when A equals one, that means the black hole is maximally spinning. It cannot spin any faster because at that point, the event horizon has shrunk so much that it is now moving at the speed of light. And note, you can also have A equals minus one, which means it's maximally spinning, but in the other direction. And in the other direction here refers to the fact that you will always have material coming in to a black hole as well that is it accreting. And sometimes that material is coming in this way, but the black hole is spinning the other way. And we refer to that as retrograde spin. Now that's what the maths tells us about supermassive black hole spins and any sort of form of black hole spin. But actually measuring the spin of a black hole with observations is incredibly difficult. Now there's a couple of ways that you can do this, but essentially what they all boil down to is that you're looking for the inner edge of that swirling disk of material that's spiraling and orbiting around your black hole, because that's what we can actually C because it glows mostly in x-rays. And the faster a black hole is spinning, the closer the inner edge of that disk of material can actually get to the event horizon. It's called the innermost stable circular orbit. And one way of pinpointing it is to use something known as the iron K alpha line. Essentially, x-ray light hits iron atoms in that swirling disk of material and transfers so much energy to the iron atom that it causes it to glow at a very specific wavelength of light that is unique only to the iron atom. And then what you can do is you can take a spectrum of the light from that swirling disk material around the black hole, and that's where you, you know, take the light and you split it through a prism so you get a trace of how much light at each wavelength you receive. And you should see a really big spike at the wavelength that we know that iron emits in x-rays. But it's smeared out to shorter wavelengths by essentially a Doppler shift caused by the fact that iron atoms are moving faster and faster as they get closer to that inner edge near the event horizon. There's also a gravitational redshift involved here as well just due to the really strong gravity of the black hole. But essentially, if you can measure how broad this line is, you can work out where the inner edge of the accretion disk is and from that, work out the spin of a supermassive black hole. Hole. That's the idea anyway, but in practice, there's a lot of debate over whether this method can actually give you like reliable estimates of the black hole spin. And there's a great review on this from Chris Reynolds that I'll link in the video description down below if you do fancy a deeper dive into it. Plus, it's not exactly the cheapest of measurements. For example, this data that I showed took 300,000 seconds of exposure time to get. That's three and a half days staring with one telescope at one object to collect enough light to actually be able to detect this. And it's why these measurements of spin only exist for a few tens of supermassive black holes that we actually have data for. Hopefully in the future there will be like an x-ray telescope that its sole mission will be to measure the spins of supermassive black holes rather than the x-ray telescopes we have now where you know any of these proposals for a really big chunk of observing time are you know in competition with other science cases, a lot of other science cases you know that don't need as much time, they're probably going to give it to them instead because they're going to be more productive. So for now, if you do want to study this, your best bet is looking at simulations to see what they find so that you can then make predictions for when we do have the data in the future. Now, one thing you're probably thinking right now is why even bother to measure the spin of a supermassive black 
hole. Well, it all comes down to how a growing, spinning supermassive black hole affects the galaxy that it's in the center of. So by supermassive here, I'm talking about like a million to tens of billions of times heavier than the sun. And we think that pretty much every galaxy has a supermassive black hole at its center. Now, as I said, when a supermassive black hole grows by bringing in that material into the accretion disk around it, that material starts to glow and give out energy, which then pushes back on any other material trying to get into the accretion disk and close to the black hole. So if you've got too much material coming in, then that pressure starts to grow. Then you end up with sort of a pressure cooker scenario where that pressure has to be relieved and that material gets burped back out from those regions around the black hole, obviously not the black hole itself. So we call this an outflow or a wind. And essentially what happens is you end up with this material sort of going along these sort of cone shapes above and below this accretion disk. So aligned with that axis that the black hole is spinning around. And if you have high enough magnetic fields, you can then get jets where the material is funneled into this tiny space by these magnetic fields and jettisoned up and out of the galaxy. I actually go into way more detail on this in my book, A Brief History of Black Holes. If you wanna grab yourself a copy, it's out in paperback in the UK on the 21st of September and in the US on October 24th. Now the energy that's in that material in the outflow or the jet then gets sort of deposited into the surrounding regions of the galaxy. And what it does there is, you know, it can heat hydrogen gas, for example. So the molecules get more energy, they've got, you know, bouncing around more. And so they're much more resistant to being collapsed under gravity to get much denser. And so you don't form as many stars. What you essentially do is effectively kill the galaxy. We call this process feedback from the growing supermassive black hole. And it is the black hole spin which determines the efficiency with which that material that comes into the accretion disk gets converted into feedback energy. The higher the spin, the more efficient that conversion is. Plus the direction of the black hole spin, so the axis that it's going round, has a huge impact on how much of an impact the outflow, that feedback energy can actually have in a galaxy. So for example, the black hole might be spinning around this axis and it might be aligned with the galaxy's axis of spin as well. That means that any outflow will just go above and below the galaxy and really only affect sort of the bits in the center. Whereas if the black hole's spin axis that it's going around is at 90 degrees to the galaxy's spin axis, and it's sort of aligned with the disk of the galaxy, that any outflow or jet is just gonna absolutely tear through that galaxy and have a huge impact in terms of feedback. So the question we had was which processes could lead to the spinning up of a black hole and aligning it with the same spin axis as the galaxies and which processes lead to a spin down of a black hole and perhaps even anti-align it with the galaxy's spin axis as well. Now, ever since my PhD, I've been studying supermassive black holes in galaxies which have been left alone for over 10 billion years. And so they have never merged together with another galaxy and so have avoided all of that sort of gravitational scrambling that comes with a merger. And what I noticed while doing those research studies was that in these galaxies that have never had a merger but left alone, the supermassive black holes in them had accretion disks around them that were brighter than you would necessarily expect given the black hole's mass. And so one explanation for that could be that the supermassive black hole is spinning that much faster and so is more efficient at converting mass into energy and therefore the light that we see that actually glows. If you think about it, a galaxy that is a pure flat disk will slowly and steadily funnel gas from the spiral arms on the outskirts down to the center to that supermassive black hole's accretion disk. So all that gas is coming in from the same plane, right? And it'll have some angular momentum that's always coming in from the same direction. So when that gas makes it into the accretion disk and then into the black hole itself, the black hole uses it to grow. Again, it will inherit that angular momentum. It has to be conserved the same before as it was after when it ends up in the black hole. And so the black hole's spin will increase, but also because it's always coming from the same direction, it'll always then end up being aligned with the same axis that the galaxy is spinning around. Whereas if you have a merger of two galaxies, it's 
very chaotic, right? Gravity is scrambling everything, sending a lot of material down to the center that the black hole can use to grow. But all that material is coming in from different angles and it's crazy and it's chaotic. And so what can happen is that you can actually cancel some of the angular momentum out, especially if you're coming in from the opposite direction to which the black hole is spinning. And so the overall effect over time is that the black hole's spin will decrease and maybe even the direction around which it's spinning, the direction that its axis that it's spinning around is pointing, could also change as well. So we set out to test just that, using the simulations that Ricardo's group have run, looking at the spin, A, and the angle between the galaxy and the black hole's spin, phi in two different samples of simulated galaxies. Those that have had lots of mergers shown in the gray and those that haven't had any shown in blue here. Now there's not as many galaxies that have had no mergers, but you can see this really obvious difference in the distribution of the spins of the supermassive black holes in these two different samples. With galaxies which haven't had a merger hosting supermassive black holes that have higher spins, just like we predicted. But we didn't really see that much difference in the angle between the black hole and galaxy spin, unless we looked at the extremes of the population. And also instead of using the galaxy properties, like no merger versus lots of mergers, as a proxy for sort of what the supermassive black hole at their centers had been through, we actually looked at the supermassive black holes themselves in the simulation and said, okay, how much of that black hole's mass, like what fraction of its mass, has got there inside that black hole due to mergers. So now here on this plot, we've got supermassive black holes with less than 10% of their mass due to mergers in blue, and those with over half of their mass due to mergers in gray. And then we saw this difference. You've got this bump here at 90 degrees misaligned in the gray histogram there, the black holes that are dominated by mergers. Whereas black holes with less than 10% of their mass due to mergers are much more likely to have their spin aligned with the galaxy spin. So it seems like the simulations agree with our original hypothesis that was inspired by what we saw in the observations. That galaxies that have never had a merger seem to have supermassive black holes with higher spins and those spins tend to be aligned with the same axis that the galaxy is spinning around. And that has huge implications for the feedback from those supermassive black holes. Because if they tend to be spinning the same axis as the galaxy, all that feedback energy that yes, is more efficient because there's a higher spin, it's just gonna get dumped above and below the galaxy rather than going ripping straight through the galaxy disk where it has a much bigger impact. And the reason that this is such a big deal is because simulations have also recently shown that less than 35% of all the matter in the universe trapped in supermassive black holes got there due to mergers. Some even estimating as low as 15%. The rest of the time, you know, in the billions of years that separate galaxy mergers that are fairly rare, you've just got a black hole being grown through a galaxy, taking gas from the outskirts where the spiral arms are and funneling it down to the very center in this very sort of slow and steady way that happens to you know, increase the spin of your black hole and align it with the same sort of spin axis as your galaxy, which then raises questions about you know, when and how the majority of this feedback, this killing of galaxies actually occurs and maybe if it has as big of an impact as we first thought. So where do we actually go from here? Well, we need to confirm this actually occurs for real in the universe with observations. Well, as I said, ideally you would measure the spins of these supermassive black holes directly, but that is very difficult to do. There's a lot of debate about whether it's even possible to get at reliable estimates and Also, it's very observationally expensive and that time on that telescope could go to another project that isn't so hotly debated over whether you could actually get reliable measurements out of it. So you have to get clever here. Now, one of the things you could do is to use the Hubble Space Telescope, HST, to take images through specific filters that only let in certain wavelengths of light that can isolate that burp, that outflow of material from the regions around the black hole that will cause the feedback. 
I mean, you'd see what that looked like for a sample of galaxies that have never had a merger and a sample that have had lots of mergers. And you can see if the orientations of where you find that outflow material are different. Is it above and below the galaxy or is it all mixed in? We know this is possible to do, it's been done before with the Hubble Space Telescope, but never for these rare merger-free galaxies. And of course, the problem is that you're in competition with every other astronomer that wants to use the Hubble Space Telescope for their science as well. I've made a short before about all the things you have to do to apply for HST time if you want to check that out. So like all things in science, this is still a work in progress. Like we've done some research and we've gotten some really cool results, which have triggered way more questions than we had before. So we've got lots of things still to test. But you can bet as soon as I have an update for you, I'll obviously be publishing a scientific research paper as is the norm, but I'll also be explaining what we found right here on this channel. Before we get to the bloopers, I just want to say a big thank you to Brilliant for sponsoring this video. Brilliant is a website and an app where you can learn new concepts across science, maths, and computer science interactively. Interactive learning has been shown to be six times more effective than passive learning, like watching videos of lectures. Plus, Brilliant's guided lessons let you explore concepts at your own pace. If you get stuck, there's helpful hints and step-by-step -step solutions to get you back on track. Now, I know a lot of you who watch my channel are budding astrophysicists or budding scientists, and the advice I always give in that case is to learn how to code. But if you're not sure where to start, check out Brilliant's new Thinking in Code course, which gets you designing simple programs to solve real world problems right away, like Maps app navigation, for example. So to try everything Brilliant has to offer for free for 30 days, head to brilliant.org forward slash Dr. Becky, or you can click on that link in the video description down below. And the first 200 of you will get 20% off Brilliant's annual premium subscription. So thank you so much to Brilliant for sponsoring this video. And now, Roll those bloopers. I feel like there's going to be quite a lot of equations on the screen in this one. How do you all feel about maths on the screen? Not the word maths. God, that was... Every <laughs> time I say maths, all the Americans are like, I don't understand. And I'm like, mathematics. The word is plural. You keep the S. You are the ones <laughs> that just took the English language and went, eh, nah. <sighs> That's there. So give the molecules more energy so that they're less sort of... So they're more resistant, not less resistant. Rah. Gets me every time. Less likely to collapse, more resistant to collapse. There's an airplane going overhead, so I'm just gonna pause that thought. Doo -doo -doo -doo. And it's the spin that determines the efficiency with efficiency. <sighs> Space is hard, words are harder. Outflows! Outflows in the jets! Bow, 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 bow. <laughs> 